everyone, and welcome to Cosmic Conversations. I'm your host, Sheila Seppi, and I am so grateful that you have joined us tonight, whether you're live or on replay. Thank you so much, so much, so much for being here. Tonight, our special guest is Debbie Solaris. Now, Debbie is an ET contactee, an interdimensional traveler, a galactic historian, and after a fateful extraterrestrial contact experience a few years ago, she woke up to her her true star lineage and her higher calling. Now, through her ancestral connections with the Akashic Records, she's been able to receive downloads of galactic history information and universal spiritual knowledge ever since. And she feels that it's a big part of her mission while she's here on Earth to help awaken others to their true divine selves and their own cosmic origins. So I'm very excited tonight that Debbie's going to be joining us and she's going to be speaking speaking to us about the influence of the galactic history on planet Earth. So I am so excited that you are here. I want to go ahead and bring you up so everyone can hello, meet everybody. you. Hello, hello. Hi. Uh, so I'm just here in uh, my office in uh, just south of Denver. I, I, I live just south of Denver um, in Colorado, so I'm not uh, very far from Sheila, um, uh, but uh, I am um, I am in a, a little town called Castle Rock. But thanks for having me here. It's a, a real honor to be here. Well, I am so glad that you're here because I have to tell you a couple years ago when I was doing a little bit of research, I happened upon your website and I was reading about it and I'm like, oh my God, she is validating a lot of stuff that I already felt. And you were one of the first few people that I actually ran across information that resonated with me. And so I wanted to send you an invitation to come into join us this year at our walk-in conference that we had earlier in the year. And I was super, super excited to hear everything that you had to share. So I know that everyone tonight's going to be just as excited to hear you as I was because you have some phenomenal information. So guys, sit back and prepare to be awed. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm I, I guess I'm going to start with just an introduction of uh, who I am and how I got started uh, with this whole thing. Um, I'm a relative latecomer to, um, you know, the metaphysical, you know, ET, uh, you know, UFO movement. Um, uh, I actually uh, was pretty much, I uh, had a uh, pretty ordinary upbringing. I was raised Roman Catholic and uh I had a career as um, in, in the U.S. Navy as a hospital corpsman for a few years, and then from there went on to do work in environmental health. So I had a very technical kind of uh, health-based background. Uh, wasn't really spiritual at all until I had an ET contact experience in 2012, um, where I actually found myself on board an extraterrestrial uh, starship. And... Uh, needless to say, that completely changed my trajectory, changed my life. Um, um, for a few years after that, I noticed that, you know, I was, uh, I was my extrasensory perception um, increased a uh, hundredfold. And I started uh, doing a lot of research on, I was just getting a lot of downloads about galactic history and star systems. And I thought I was going crazy, at least at first. And then uh, eventually, um, I did start doing a lot of research on my own and as well as taking a lot of spiritual classes um, on spirituality, all kinds of spirituality. And then from there, uh, I started taking courses in Akashic readings um, in, in my hometown of Castle Rock. You know, I lived just like south of Denver and I was fortunate that there was um, uh, an instructor here that taught that. And uh, um, it, it start, I started realizing that uh, just from my work with the Akashic Records, I've been doing it now since 2014. Um, that's when I started going, I think, <laughs> professional with it. And uh, started realizing that a lot of the, the downloads I was getting, the information I was receiving from the higher realms was actually from the Akashic Records. And that, um, 
uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, our, our galactic history and who we are as, you know, uh, spiritual beings, you know, having this human experience right now. Um, my focus really when I do galactic history is more on the star systems that have had an impact on planet Earth, you know, that, um, I mean, uh, I know there's other uh, galactic historians who focus on all kinds of different races of beings. Um, I like to focus in on more of the uh, extraterrestrial races that have had a direct influence on planet Earth because this is where we're at right now. And, you know, how does that work for us? Uh, so um, to get started here, um, I'm going to go ahead and I think I'm going to go ahead and bring up um, the little slideshow I have. And I don't know if we can do picture and picture or not, but um, it, I might just have to switch between the slideshow and my face because um, I don't like just sl slideshow. I like sometimes, you know, the interaction with all of you. So and I'll be able to show both. OK, OK, great. So um, so this is the slideshow here. Let me go ahead and bring that up. Um, and then um, I, I guess I need to do like a screen share, a, a screen share. Let me do that. Let me get back on Zoom. OK, um, so share screen and let me do that one. OK, so let's do a share. And then I'm going to try to do this as far as a play by. OK, so here we are. OK, um, so. Um, so, so how, how, you know, so I guess, you know, the thing that we want to talk about tonight is galactic history and its impact on earth development. So um, why does, um, you know, so a lot of us have already known that, I mean, I think a lot of us now are, are realizing that earth's history is a lot, you know, longer than it, than it seems, you know, that it just seems like it's a lot more ancient, a lot, there's a lot more extraterrestrial influences than what historians in the past would like us to believe. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, here we go. Um, so right now, um, so this is a little image here of kind of a, a, a Pleiadian depiction of um, how uh, extraterrestrial races have impacted Earth. Um, so the image that you see on the top is um, Andromeda Galaxy. Um, so there is a difference between Andromeda Galaxy and Andromeda Constellation. A lot of people get those confused, um, but they're actually two separate asterisms. Uh, so, um, and so from there, we're going to start talking about the, the Lyra system. So how uh, from uh, Andromeda galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy was formed, and then the, the Lyra system, how that was formulated, that was considered to be the home of human consciousness. So we're going to spend a little time on Lyra and Vega. And then uh, from there, they talk about the Pleiades. Um, and you know some of the outlier systems in our solar system, such as Maldek and Mars, how that influenced Earth, and then uh, Sirius and all these other systems. Um, so when I'm doing, uh, you know, when I'm talking about, when I'm trying to set the stage for our history and how this impacted our planet, uh, we have to look at Andromeda Galaxy. Um, so right now, um, you know. There has been many ET races who have visited planet Earth. Okay, this has been ongoing for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so um, it's important to realize that we don't really understand the, the history of humanity without really looking at the impact of these of these systems. Um, and uh, I'd like to start off, uh, I'm going to kind of stay on this slide for a little bit just to give you guys a backdrop on Andromeda Galaxy because it's really important. Uh, so a lot of people, a lot of um, scientists and, and astronomers say that Andromeda Galaxy was the sister galaxy to, um, to, to Milky Way, the Milky Way Galaxy. But actually what I saw in the Akashic Records, and this was something that kind of surprised me uh, because I, I came from a very scientific background, uh, but what I saw in the records was that 
The Milky Way was actually formulated in the Andromeda galaxy and it's separated. Um, so through the separation uh, created this template. So, and we're gonna follow this template throughout the entire presentation. So when source initially split itself off, it split itself off into father God consciousness and mother goddess consciousness. Uh, and that's been the kind of the ongoing template that a lot of these star races have developed from. Uh, so when the Milky Way was split off from, uh, you know, from, from the Andromeda galaxy, there was a portal that was created, uh, which uh, was called the Antari Stargate. Uh, so the Antari Stargate is the portal that connects the Andromeda galaxy to the Milky Way. And then through this portal, there was higher dimensional beings, so co-creator beings that came in through this portal um, to start developing physicality and the separation from source in this particular galaxy. So Antares is in the constellation of Scorpio, which is actually uh, located very close to galactic center. Galactic center is considered to be at 28 degrees uh, Sagittarius. Um, so uh, basically I say that galactic center is between the Scorpio constellation and Sagittarius constellation. And then from there, there was these co-creator beings that formulated galactic councils um, in a star system called Altair, which is in the Aquila constellation, which then uh, brought us to, um, to, the, to the development of the Lyra, Lyra system. Uh, we're going to move into Lyra, so let me just get it through some of these slides here. Um, so, uh, so how does ET history impact planet Earth? Um, so, uh, millions of years ago, okay, um, you know, so there was a number of extraterrestrial races who uh, they say at least twenty-two races, which I'm going to name in a minute that uh, decided they wanted to start an experiment on planet Earth. So. So planet Earth uh, was kind of like a backdrop. It was kind of like a microcosm of the macrocosm. So planet Earth was like considered to, to be like this small little environment where extraterrestrial races were bringing in DNA from different parts of the galaxy to see how it would interact together in one planet. Okay, so we've had influences from Sirius. We're gonna talk about Sirius. Uh, Pleiades, um, Andromeda, Arcturus, and many other star systems, uh, which I'm going to name here in a minute. So I'm going to get to this. Um, so, so uh, because we've had, so Earth is also known as the living library. So Earth was a mix mixing ground for all these different genetics. Like I said before, it was being played out on a smaller scale. Um, so, so this has been kind of an ongoing experiment, um, starting from very, uh, I would say probably millions of years ago, but, um, uh, but if we were starting from the civilizations of Lemuria, that would be tens of thousands of years ago. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Uh, so some of the star systems that have impacted planet earth, uh, let me go ahead and bring up my slide here too. Um, we're not going to talk about all of these, but we'll talk about as many of them as we can, is uh, Lyra, which Vega is the main star in the Lyra system, uh, but, but we're going to talk about two, two different races in Lyra. Um, Antares, which we just mentioned, it was the original Stargate um, in our galaxy. Andromeda, Arcturus, Sirius A, B, and C, Procyon. Uh, he, uh, Pleiades, Hiades, uh, Hiades is in the Taurus constellation, just like the Pleiades. Um, Aldebaran, also in the Taurus constellation. Draco, Orion, Zeta Reticuli, Cassiopeia, Alpha Centauri, and Beta Centauri, which is Hadar, um, Apollonia, Tau Ceti, and likely others as well. Um, we're going to probably focus mostly on Lyra at first. Uh, so these are the main star systems we're going to talk about. Uh, Lyra, Vega, Sirius, Pleiades, Arcturus, Andromeda, and Orion. Um, so, 
So getting into Lyra, okay. Uh, so a lot of people, um, when I do Akashic readings, I oftentimes, I, and this is a depiction of a, what we thought looked like a Lyran being. Um, so they were tall, kind of white-skinned humans, uh, at least uh, the father god consciousness race was. Um, there was also a mother goddess consciousness race that was the blue-skinned Vega people, um, which we're going to show in a minute. But um, I, I don't know if I have a depiction of them or not. No, I don't think I do. Um, but one of these days I'll have to get uh, blue-skinned Vega beings in here. But um but these beings uh, were considered to be kind of the founder races of the humanoid races throughout this galaxy. Uh, so um, because the co-creators were creating physical life in the Lyra system, they chose Lyra for two reasons. Number one, it was located fairly close to galactic center. So remember galactic center is between Scorpio and Sagittarius. And then we have the Aquila constellation and then right above Aquila, which is the Eagle constellation is the Lyra constellation. And the Lyra constellation has, um, I would say, uh, has the conditions most inhabitable for physical life. So that was why these beings chose the Lyra system. Because if you look at the Lyra constellation, it looks like a little kite, which I'm gonna show a picture of in a moment. It doesn't, it's not very significant. Um, it's only 13 stars, you know, kind of a small system. Um, so why would the co-creators choose this system? It was because they had really inhabitable planets. And that's true even today. Even today, these systems, um, uh, these, this particular constellation still to this day has exoplanets that are considered to be inhabitable. Um, even millions of years later. So, uh, so that's pretty impressive. Um, so uh, when the co-creators were creating physical life in Lyra, they were taking um, genetics from other universes and kind of combining them. So you see a lot of hybridization initially in, in the layer in history. So you see hybridization with feline beings and avian beings and elementals. And so there's, there was this kind of like this, this, um, this genetic mix that was occurring initially in the Lyra system. And then from there, uh, they were starting to develop what we now know as humanoids, you know, so, so initial, uh, so initially there was this kind of mix and then they created two human races, uh, the white Lyrans were, that were considered to be more of the father God consciousness representation and the blue Vega people, which were the mother goddess consciousness representation. So that's how, I, that's why I call it Lyra Vega, because um, there is two human races we're talking about. Um, so, uh, so they say that the first humans in our galaxy originated from Lyra. So that's why it's called the home of human consciousness. And uh, much of the um, ancient world was actually uh, here on earth was actually uh, um, influenced by the Lyra, Lyra people and the Vega people. Um, so they were visiting earth even way back when. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so this is, so how old is earth really? So we're gonna move on from that. I wanna talk a little bit about the Lyra star system itself. So, um, so like I said, it was a small constellation. Um, it's located in the fourth quadrant of the Northern Hemisphere, which is NQ4. It's actually located very close to uh, Draco constellation, which that is gonna have a big impact on Lyran history. Um, and uh, also Aquila, Hercules, and uh, Cygnus. Uh, Cygnus is the swan constellation. Cygnus actually contains a huge black hole, which is called Ec a Cygnus X-1. Um, so uh, Vega or Alpha Lyrae is the biggest star in Lyra. It's the fifth brightest star in our night sky. And it was once considered to be Earth's North Star. So Earth, many, many, thousands of years ago, um, it's, it's north axis was actually um, aligned with 
with Vega. Okay, um, so this is this also has symbolic meaning that our original human template was aligned with the system. Um, so for Lyra Vega star people, like I mentioned before, are our cosmic ancestors. Um, most of our genetics uh, came from that system. Um, they were renowned to live in beautiful paradise planets. Uh, so they lived in these beautiful planets for thousands of years. So a lot of people mistakenly think that Lyra was created and then Draco came and destroyed everything right away. You no, know, that they actually lived in complete peace and unity consciousness for thousands of years before the Lyra Draconian Wars. So speaking of the wars, okay, uh, Lyra civilization was destroyed um, during the Lyra Draconian Wars. So what happened was, just to give you a quick rundown, really quick rundown, is that uh, dr the Draconians wanted to conquer Lyra's system. It, they, the system was located very close to Draco, but they noticed that uh, the Laren planets had a lot of resources, so they wanted to conquer that for themselves. And so they ambushed the Laren system and uh, uh, they had uh, much better technology. They've had technology for thousands and thousands of years and uh, uh, had uh, larger, larger armadas of ships that were able to overtake the Lyra system and several planets were destroyed during that conflict. This created a mass exodus of human beings or human humanoid beings that left that system to, to they escaped the Laren system as refugees and colonized other systems throughout the galaxy, which we're gonna see here in a moment. So, uh, so yeah, so there, so uh, most of the white Laren people ended up in, in, um, in Pleiades and Andromeda. So uh, this is just in kind of an overview. So it's not um, there. I mean, they ended up in a lot of different places, but but I would say uh, just kind of as a general overview, most of the Larens ended up in the Pleiades and Andromeda. Most of the Vega people ended up in Sirius and Orion. Okay, so let's a little bit about their history here. So um, the white Laren race, um, like I mentioned before, was the representation of the Omega Father God consciousness. Um, so these beings were humanoid and were said to be the, um, the, the, the root race of humanoid races. Um, uh, so some Larens, um, so I was mentioning the hybridization aspect of Larens, you know, some of them had cat-like features. So you see an image here of like a cat-like being. Uh, some of them had bird-like features and some of them looked very similar to humans. Uh, they were very varied as far as their hair color and uh, skin and eye color. Uh, so it depended on what planets they were in. Um, and let's see here, let me get another bullet here. So Lyran's played an important part in the creation of humanity, um, like I mentioned before. And then I also mentioned before about the blue Vega races. Um, so they were the representation of the alpha mother goddess consciousness. Remember that's the, the main template we're working with here. Um, so the Vegans were kind of a little bit different from the white Lyran's in that they were more of a spiritual, spiritual oriented race. So these people were, um, were more uh, spirituality and healing focused. However, they were an older race than the white Laren. So they had, they were a little bit more advanced as far as their technology. So not as many of them perished during the Laren Wars. Uh, I would say mostly, uh, most of the uh, casualties came out of the two planets of, of Avalon and Avion, which were the white Laren realm. But, um, uh, but Vega too ended up having to um, abandon their star system, which is really sad. Uh, so these, these people were more focused on spirituality which is gonna have a big influence on the, the consequent systems that they they colonized, which was uh, serious. Um, 
Okay, and I mentioned the technology. They, they actually had really advanced starships um, compared to the Laren people that were just barely getting their feet wet with um, technology. So uh, like I said, the Vega people had better ships, so they were able to rescue more of their people. Um, um, so let's see if else comes up here. Um, so the Vegan people too also played a very important colonization role throughout the galaxy and especially on earth. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move on. So some of the contributions they made to earth was, um, uh, so during the creation of humanity, the Lyrans contributed the element of fire to earth and gifted humanity with the Lyran work ethic. Um, so a lot of our, I think just our, our civilization or our, our values, I think come from Lyra, you know, the values of family, hard work. Uh, these people were agricultural people. So um, a lot of our history of agriculture probably was influenced from Lyra. Uh, and then on top of that, um, the Larens also contributed a lot of knowledge to Atlantis. Uh, we're gonna talk about Atlantis a little bit later on and, and Lemuria. Um, so this was in regards to the use of physical energy. So Larens are excellent. Um, they're more physically oriented. So the, the Vega, Blue Vega people were more spiritually oriented. White Larians were more physically oriented. Um, so they had mastered the energies of the divine masculine, and then they understood um, the often overlooked power of good old fashioned hard work, you know, so, so that concept came from Lyra. Um, also, many of the Lyran humans who lived in the Lyran planets, uh, like I mentioned before, were agricultural, particularly in Avion, Avalon, Apex, Bela, Tika, and Merok. And they brought these important skills to planet Earth. Um, Vega colonists on Earth brought the skills of physical healing to the planet. So my understanding is that Ayurvedic medicine originated from the Vega star system. And this was a modality that's been in place on earth. It came out of India, but it was, it's been on place on earth for thousands and thousands of years. And we still use it today. I mean, it's still an important, uh, very important uh, modality that's used you know, throughout, throughout the world today. Um, so we're gonna move on to Sirius. Okay, so, um, so after the Lyra Draconian Wars, a lot of um, the Vega people and even some of the other Lyrans ended up in Sirius. Um, and Sirius is actually kind of a trinary star system. Initially, uh, I think now it's binary. I, I don't think Sirius C exists anymore, but, um, but it used to be Sirius A, B, and C. So that's why it's considered to be the brightest star in our night sky, which I'm gonna talk about when we see the slide with the, the Syrian uh, um, star system. Um, it's actually in the constellation of Canis Major, this, which is considered to be the big dog. Um, uh, so the Lyran and Vega refugees um, mostly settled in Sirius A. Um, uh, there was some colonization in Sirius B and ultimately in Sirius C, um, but my understanding from the Akashic records is that Sirius C got destroyed and the planet Nibiru got shot off in a trajectory towards Earth. So those beings ended up, um, they're now the beings that we know as the Anunnaki, they ended up inhabiting Earth, uh, which is a whole other story. But um, so uh, they ended up, uh, actually most of those refugees ended up in uh, Sirius A because most of the planets there were uninhabited and they were suitable for, for life, you know? So they had some nice watery planets there. So they settled there. Um, and the, initially the Lyran people, the white Lyrans and the blue Vega people were kind of separate, okay? They didn't really interact that much with each other when they were living in Lyra. But then when they got together in Sirius, they decided, hey, you know, we're together here, let's create a new civilization. So they intermarried, intermixed with each other, and ultimately they created the new Syrian race. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, ancient Egypt, if African tribes and other ancient people also have legends and connections with the, the Sirius star system. So you see Sirius pop up a lot in ancient civilizations on earth, uh, particularly Egypt and uh, even the Mayan cultures and African tribes like the Dogon tribe. Let's talk about Sirius, the star system. Um, so Sirius is known as the dog star or the blue star. Um, it's, it's a binary star system. It's comprised of two stars, um, Sirius A and Sirius B, but also Sirius C. Now the Dogon people in Africa, these, this was an African tribe, they knew a long time ago that Sirius was more than one star. And, but they, these were considered to be primitive people. How did they know this? Well, they knew it from their contact with Syrian beings that visited earth a long time ago. Um, so like I mentioned before, Sirius is the brightest star in our night sky because it's there's several stars combined. Um, and it's also because it's located only 8.7 light years. So it's one of our closest star neighbors. Um, it's home to many galactic species. So Sirius is considered to be one of the most diverse as far as beings that live on Sirius. Uh, so, so there's some physical beings, there's some non-physicals, humanoid, non-humanoid. Um, most of them are considered to be benevolent towards earth people. Um, some of them aren't. Uh, Sirius actually had not only you know, Syrian humanoids, but they also had cat people that lived in Sirius, dog people. They had a lot of aquatic beings. Um, dolphins and whales were considered to be from Sirius originally, and uh, also reptilians. Okay, so, so there were some reptilians also that settled in Sirius. Uh, some were benevolent and some weren't. So not all, not all reptilians are bad. Um, uh, like I mentioned before, Sirius played a major part in Earth's history. You're gonna hear that um, pop up yeah. quite a bit. And um, Medina, Medina, if Cher does, wants to hang out with us during the day, if she can, I, I don't know if you want her to be a part uh, of I'm that. sorry, someone needs to go on mute. Doing. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on here. So, uh, so the first star people that visited Earth was likely from Sirius. Um, so they visited Earth four to five million years ago. So I think Earth's uh, history is a lot older than um, our scientists would like us to believe. And uh, um, we did, they did have a connection with to Atlantis, Egypt, and particularly Egypt and Samaria. Uh, Syrians were considered to be um, they were very practical people. So they were mother goddess consciousness people, but because mothers take care of things and Syrians were uh, masters at navigating physical reality, um, they became known as the masters of physical healing. So a lot of our healing modalities that we currently use today originated from Sirius. That would include Reiki, crystal healing, Meridian work, so that includes acupuncture and uh, in reflexology, all came from Sirius. Uh, also, massage therapy came from Sirius. Um, a lot of our medical, um, our even our allopathic medical mo uh, model comes from Sirius. Uh, so you see a lot of Syrian star seeds that end up becoming doctors and nurses here, even here on Earth. Uh, a little bit about their history and culture. Um, so uh, it was decided early in Syrian history that um, the culture would be based on the alpha mother goddess consciousness and have more of a uh, uh, an emphasis on the divine feminine. So even though you know Sirius A people were very technically adept, I mean they had great technology. Um, their focus was really on spirituality and healing, just like their forefathers from the, the Vega system. Um, so despite uh, this learnt leaning towards the feminine principles, initially the focus of the beings of Sirius A was to ramp up their technology. 
And they were doing this for survival purposes. You know, these people were like, you know, hey, we just survived a horrific war from, you know, the Lyra system. We don't want this to happen again. So we need to really ramp up on our technology. Um, so, and they were trying to prevent for future attacks from not only the Draconian system, but also the Orion system because they were located so close to the Orion constellation. Um, so they also wanted to upgrade their starships for star exploration purposes. Um, so Syrian people were very concerned about information and knowledge. They, they were especially concerned that a lot of information and knowledge was lost during the wars. Um, so they spent generations sending star exploration ships out to gather information and storehouse it in Sirius. Uh, and that this was also a big part of their history. Um, eventually, um, they integrated their original Vega-based um, feminine-oriented qualities and skill sets as they moved away from the original focus on technology and started to become more of a spiritual civilization. And we're seeing this happening even here on Earth, where like right now, Earth is really focused on ramping up technology, okay? But we're also moving towards the age of Aquarius right now, where we're going to start be integrating more spirituality. In, and this is currently happening as we speak, you know? So, um, so we're seeing a similar pattern that has occurred in other star systems also start, uh, occurring here on Earth as far as our evolution as a civilization. Um, so the Syrians are definitely a model for that as well. Um, so they be started becoming more service to others oriented. So, um, uh, so they started focusing more on healing and higher level spirituality. So because of this mass information that they have collected for generations, um, they started storehousing it in the Syria system, and then they created the Syrian mystery schools, of which many of our earth mystery schools are based off of, you know, particularly the Egyptian mystery schools. But, um, but even now today, you see people developing mystery schools, you know, that are um, kind of an offshoot of the Syrian mystery schools. Uh, um, so because of this, um, like I mentioned before, they were considered to be the masters of physical healing. Now, a lot of our connections to ascended masters, um, a lot of them were based out of Sirius. Uh, they were teachers and mentors in these Syrian mystery schools. So a lot of us feel as star seeds and light workers, we feel this connection to ascended masters. Well, a lot of that came from the Syrian mystery schools. So what are they, their contributions to Earth? So we're going to get into that. Um, so Sirius uh, is one of the four races of beings that took a primary role in the seeding of life on Earth. So Syrians were considered to be master geneticists. So these people um, were having visits on Earth as far back as four to five million years ago. Um, so they were initially just kind of like exploration. So they weren't really doing much colonization at that point. They were just kind of visiting and checking out planet Earth. And uh, so it was mainly scientific in nature. And then they would go back to Sirius. Um, but eventually, um, along with other galactic beings with from the Lyra and the Pleiades, uh, so the Syrians created uh, two successive versions of human beings. Um, when they mixed their DNA with that of the humanoid species that were already inhabiting Earth. Uh, so, um, so we went from, you know, Neanderthal humans to Cro, you know, and Cro-Magnon human to human, you know, uh, Homo sapiens, which was, you know, the integration. Uh, so there's a reason why human beings evolved so rapidly was because of the um, the influx of genetics from the Syrian uh, master geneticists who were trying to upgrade you know human genetics um, at that time. Uh, now there was also a downgrade of human genetics which I'm going to get to um, in a little bit but um, but initially humans were supposed to have earth humans were supposed to have 12 strand DNA and uh, were supposed to have, you know, this, um, and we still to this day, I would say the majority of us here on earth, 
we're kind of a Heinz 57 of, of genetics from different star races, but I would say probably most of us here on earth have contained Syrian genetics, you know, so um, some of us maybe have a certain percentage of Pleiadian gen genetics, certain percentage of Syrian genetics. So I don't know, maybe one of these days we'll have to, scientists will develop a way to, to analyze the junk DNA. Maybe that's all alien DNA, I don't know, but um, that would be interesting to see how much of our DNA actually comes from these other star systems. Uh, so Syrians, like I mentioned before, they specialized in physical aura and crystal healing. Um, so many earth uh, healers feel an affinity to Sirius for that reason. Um, and like I mentioned before, you know, the, the modalities of Reiki, acupuncture and massage therapy originated from the Sirius system, that which we still use here on here on earth today, um, very successful systems, um, modalities. Much of these Atlantean knowledge that contain crystal healing, aura work and light energy healing um, uh, was also a gift from the Syrians. So the Syrians taught the Atlantean these skills and then this was also taught, you know, passed down to the Egyptians and uh, have since passed down to many civilizations today. Uh, so souls from Sirius came to Egypt. Um, so there was many Syrian teachers that were visiting Egypt and they brought structure and civilization to the earth human society. Um, so like I said, mentioned before, Syrians were practical people. They knew how to navigate physical reality. So much of our concepts of business and government and, um, other structural type organizational systems came out of Sirius. Um, they were also, they had uh, wonderful technologies that innate, they taught the Egyptians how to build the pyramids and the templates that had pathways and tunnel connections to the stars and inner worlds. Um, it was their way of bringing both of these worlds together. Okay, we're going to move on to the Pleiades. Um, so th this was another star system that had a huge influence on planet Earth. Uh, and it's one that's near and dear to my heart. I'm not, I'm not a Pleiadian star seed. I'm an Arcturian star seed, but um, I spent many lifetimes in the Pleiades. So um, I feel like it's like my second star home, you know, so, um, so I personally love the Pleiades. Um, so the Pleiadian people were actually descendants of Lyran refugees that came from the Lyra Draconian conflicts. And they mainly settled in this particular little star cluster that was called the Pleiades that was in the Taurus constellation. Now, most of them came from the planet Avalon. But we also had some Laren refugees from other, uh, probably from Avion, I think also came to the Pleiades system. Now, some of them did end up in Aldebaran, which is another star system in the Taurus constellation and also in the Hyades, which is the, the group of stars that make up that kind of V shape that you see in the Taurus constellation. But we're, for, for this purposes, we're going to focus on the Pleiades because they were the, had the most influence on Earth. Uh, so um, they say that uh, the Pleiades is, um, has, is about eight light years across. So it's a huge asterism. So it's, and it's, and it's within a much bigger constellation, which is Taurus. You know, so Taurus, all of us know Taurus from the Zodiac. Um, so they say there's about 14 stars, um, seven of which are very well known. Um, so uh, since their departure from Lyra, the Pleiadian people have since developed this new civilization in the Pleiades cluster, mainly focusing on integration of technology and spirituality um, that was mainly influenced by their connections with the Arcturians and also the Andromedans. You know, so they had some influences from those systems as well. Um, so these were a very ancient race of humanoids. Um, and they came to Earth uh, not as far back as the Syrians, but they started visiting Earth about 200,000 years ago. They say 2,000, 25,000 BC. <laughs> so it's a long time ago. I don't even know if I said that right. but um, And they played a huge part in our evolution. Um, 
And uh, they've been pretty much tracking our planet ever since, you know, so a lot of, a lot of earth humans feel a connection to the Pleiades. Maybe they're, they, they're star seeds from the Pleiades or they feel a genetic connection to them. Um, so we have quite a few people that connect with Pleiadian beings. Um, now let's talk about the Pleiades as a system. Um, so we're gonna bring that up here. So this is an open star cluster in the Taurus constellation. Now the Pleiades, unlike Sirius, is far from Earth. It's 500 light years away. So if you can see the Pleiades in the night sky with your naked eye, but it looks like it's far away, <laughs> okay? So, I mean, unless you have a telescope or something, but it, you can see it on a bright night, but it, it looks far away. It looks like it's far away. So it's, it, it is 500 light years. Um, now, the main star systems within the Pleiades, as you see in this image, is Alcyon, which is the centermost star system in the Pleiades system, Tigeta, which was the home of the Pleiadian branch of the Galactic Federation. Um, so I'm generalizing here. They, 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 there's a lot more to these star systems than just that. But uh, Merope, um, Merope was home of psycho-spiritual healing. Uh, Selino, Electra, Maya, which was the home of, of shamanism and nature religion, Asterope, Atlas, and Pleione. Um, so uh, Pleiadian star people um, were mostly descendants of Lyran refugees who escaped the Lyran Draconian War. So most of them settled in Alcyon and Tigeta, but also colonized other Pleiadian systems. Uh, so initially when the Pleiadians were leaving Lyra and arrived in the Pleiades, they settled in Alcyon and Tigeta. Those were the two major systems. Uh, but then from there, they started colonizing, you know, some of the other places such as Electra and Selino and Asterope, Maya and Merope and Pleione. Um, so this was a very important star system. Um, it still is today, but it was very important to ancient um, earth civilizations because a lot of these civilizations had felt like their ancestry came from the Pleiades. Uh, just recently, my husband and I, we visited Chich Chichen Itza in the Yucatan in Mexico. And I noticed while I was there that they were talking about all these temples that were aligned with the Pleiades or Venus was either Pleiades or Venus. Um, and the reason for that is because the Mayan people felt that their ancestry came from the Pleiades. Um, this is true also of Native American civilization. So those folks also um, felt their ancestry. They talked about, they came from the star people, particularly the Pleiades. Um, so these would be tribes like the Lakota, the Cheyenne, um, Navajo. So a lot of these star, these Native American groups felt an ancestry to the Pleiades as well, um, particularly to the Merope and Maya systems, but, um, but overall the Pleiades. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so Pleiadians, unlike the um, Syrians, so Syrians were very physically oriented. Pleiadians were more emotionally oriented. So they were considered to be the masters of unconditional love, goddess energy, and higher consciousness. So, so when you um, when you talk when you talk about Pleiadian healing modalities, most of them are more emotional, emotional or psycho spiritual based, as opposed to the the more physical healing from Sirius. So what about, let's, let's talk about their little, little history and culture here. Um, how are we doing on time, Sheila? Am I doing okay on time? You know what? You're doing great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I'm on track. Uh, so uh, galactic history. So I didn't do a good job with these, <laughs> with these bullets. I put way too much words in them, but, um, but uh, so uh, the Pleiadians today are a hybrid of the indigenous human population that have come from the planets of the star constellation Pleiades and refugees that came from the planet Avalon and other planets in the Lyra system. Um, 
So through galactic wars, um, Avalon is the first known human war that experienced a horrific destruction at the hands of the reptilians. And like I mentioned before, most of the Pleiadian star people came from Avalon. Um, we'll hear, we'll hear about a Avalon. Now that's, Avalon was considered to be kind of the template for utopian society, even here on earth. Uh, so the King Arthurian legends, you know, you know, here the, the mention of creating Avalon, you know, that was based on the original Lyra homeworld. Um, so from there, um, the inhabitants set out to seek safe refuge on distant planets uh, far away. So they picked the Pleiades because it was so far away. It's so 500 light years. So they were just trying to get the heck out of Dodge. Okay, so... Um, and so the majority of Larens, um, they settled initially, like I mentioned before, in Alcyon and Taigeta, and then eventually branched out into the other star systems. Uh, some Pleiadians found themselves here on Earth and decided to colonize different areas of Earth. Um, so we see like a lot of colonization, Pleiadian colonization in Northern European areas, particularly the, the, you know, the British Isles, um, and Scandinavia, you know, maybe northern, northern France and northern Germany. Uh, but we also see colonization of, of Pleiadians also somewhat in the Mediterranean, although there was a lot of Syrian influence there too. And um, also within the indigenous groups on planet Earth. Uh, so we're going to do this. So we mentioned the Native Americans, for instance. Uh, um, so Pleiadians are a race of humans that um, they've, they've come to, uh, so their main mission as far as working with us here on earth is to help us to reach the higher planes of spirituality and to fight the evil agenda that of other races through the positive powers of the universe. So they're talking about the, the malevolent races, such as the draconians, gray aliens, um, other malevolent races, you know, some of the or negative Orion factions that have had an influence on planet Earth. So they're trying to help us counteract that and bring in light consciousness to this planet. Um, because of their past history, um, and I could go, like, I could spend hours on Pleiadian history because the Pleiadians went through their own evolution as far as um, working toward a, a past trauma that was experienced by their Lyran um, ancestors and trying to um, evolve past that past trauma. Um, so they spent a lot of time on psycho-spiritual healing. Um, so, so because of this, they have a hard time, um, uh, I think, with um, seeing other worlds that are being enslaved or going through emotional distress. Um, so, um, and so they have a hard time with other civilizations that are trying to take advantage of planets like earth, uh, you know, because we're kind of behind in the evolution, evolutionary scale. So, um, so they're trying to help us evolve, you know, so, so they're trying to help set the, the way of the light worker. Um, so a lot of light workers feel a connection to the Pleiades for that reason. Um, so Pleiadians possess advanced technologies that allow them to protect their star systems from the reptilians. So like the Syrians, they were also working on their technology. They, they developed it quite a lot from their past Lyran days. Um, and uh, they also, um, were a big part of the Galactic Federation, um, which was offering a, per, a alliance between benevolent races. So it's kind of like the, I don't know if you guys are into Star Wars, but, um, or not Star Wars, I'm sorry, Star Trek. Um, Star Wars is Orion, okay, but Star Trek. Star Trek is basically, um, I think the story of the Galactic Federation. So these, uh, so on Star Trek, they talk about the United Federation of Planets. Um, is it basically a model? Um, it's based off of the Galactic Federation, um, which was a 
a lot of there was a lot of different star people that were members of this federation, um, and the Pleiadians were one of the major members of it. Um, so they were all they so even to this day, Pleiadian uh, galactic federation ships are um, in our solar system, uh, mainly between the area between the asteroid belt and Jupiter. So they're keeping an eye on planet Earth. They're making sure that we don't get invaded or being taken over by malevolent beings. Um, so they play a big part in that. And um, they've actually intervened uh, maybe in a kind of more subtle way in um, assisting us here on Earth. They can't really interfere with our you know, with our free will, but, you know, if we ask them for help, they, they will certainly help us. Um, so a little contributions on earth here. Um, so uh, Pleiadian language and the alphabets of earth are both very similar. So our language actually our most of the language here on planet earth originated from a language called Tamil which is uh, a, a language that was spoken by Laran people and Pleiadians. Uh, so this was uh, happened about 11,000 years ago. Um, and so the script was actually developed here on earth, but brought back to the Pleiades, which is really interesting. Um, but the language was based on, so this is how they contributed to planet earth, which I think is really cool. Um, I, um, I used to study languages, so I, I think this is really interesting how um, much of our language is based on, on the Pleiadian language. Uh, so, um, so this was considered to be a pre-Sumerian language, um, and uh, it, was, it was spoken in Sumeria, and then um, much of Earth's languages have developed from there. Now, there are some outlier languages that have that don't connect with this, but I would say majority of language was based on Tamil. Um, now, Pleiadian people are also very affluent and articulate when speaking any of our languages uh, or discussing our sciences, history, because they've been very familiar with, uh, with Earth ways. They know how things are here on Earth. So for those of you who have Pleiadian guides, um, you have the best guides um, because they're pretty hands-on. Um, when I do Akashic readings um, and I, get, I work with Pleiadian star seeds and we work with their guides, they have pretty fantastic guides. Um, now all star guides are awesome, okay? But, um, but Pleiadian uh, guides in particular know the ways of earth so they can directly guide us on what we should do here on earth. Uh, so that's what I what I mean by them being um, quite uh, they're 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 quite awesome in that way. Um, so um, their lifespans actually exceed ours by at least ten times. So so Pleiadian beings can live like hundreds of years, you know, as opposed to Earth people. You know, we we barely make it to 100, maybe. You know, if we're lucky, most of us kind of you know start withering away at around 80 to 80 years. But I think that's going to change, though. I think we're going to start. Um, I think even now, a lot of us are reverse aging. We're um, you know, our, our DNA is upgrading, you know, with these shifts and changes in our vibration. And so the Pleiadians are helping with us, us with that too. Now they also have massive technology. So um, the Pleiades, even though it's 500 light years away, um, they can travel anywhere in our universe um, in speeds faster than the speed of light with their beam ships that you see a representation of here. Um, Pleiadians um, also use the oceans for undersea operations, so they're very concerned about our misuse for our sciences, and they feel like we've complete, completely lost our spiritual focus um, because we're more focused on technology and science than we are on spirituality, when actually they need to be integrated, okay? Um, now, we're moving towards that. Just like the Syrians, we're going to move past, you know, this dependence on technology and develop our, you know, just like our star um, ancestors did. So we're going to start developing spiritually. Um, um, they feel like uh, politics, religion, and money um, is pretty much, uh, 
they're earth-based um, and uh, they're kind of matrix oriented. Uh, so they don't really have money or, or have any use for politics or um, religion in the Pleiades. Um, and I've had my own Pleiadian guides tell me that. So, um, cause I was asking a lot of questions about why is there politics and why is there so much, you know, religion here? Well, religion's a man-made construct. We all have a con direct connection with source um, and the Pleiadians know that. Um, uh, Pleiadians as well as other ET groups um, have left descendants on earth in the past. Um, so that's why they colonized Earth um, in, in the uh, even be, before Lemuria days, um, and uh, we've seen you know we see Pleiadian influence throughout Earth even today. Um, so as far as their connection with us today, um, they say they're willing to help us, but uh, but not in at, not as far as impeding on our free will, you know. So. Uh, so they have to follow the, the construct of universal law of non-interference, but um, they will help us if we ask for it. Um, uh, so let's go to Arcturus. Um, this is a favorite for a lot, for me in particular, and a lot of people feel a connect. A lot of people say they have Arcturian guides, um, and Arcturus plays a huge part in um, also with uh, the spiritual development of earth. Um, not so much with the physical aspects of earth, but more with the spiritual um, and, and, um, development. Uh, so Arcturus was a separate consciousness from the Lyra Vega consciousness. So, so um, they came from a star system called Bodes, which is actually located if you, if you see a star map, I have one on my wall here, but um, that you guys can't see, but if you look at a star map, here's Lyra, here's Draco, and then on the other side of Draco is Bodis. Um, and they came from the system. Uh, they were part of a separate consciousness that was developed to be kind of the overseers or the guardians of the galaxy. So they have a different evolution than the Lyra Vega refugees that, you know, escaped the Lyran systems, you know, so, um, so a lot of people uh, might say, you know, oh, well, Arcturians were descended from Lyrans. No, they weren't. They were a separate consciousness. Uh, so they came from uh, the big star called Arcturus, which we're going to talk more about in another slide here in a moment. Um, now, this system is fairly close to Earth, too, relatively speaking. They're about 36 light years from Earth. Um, so according to Edgar Cayce, uh, who, who I'm a big fan of, I, um, he's like one of my, one of my idols or guides, you know, along with Dolores Cannon, I love her too. Um, but Edgar Cayce uh, had a connection with Arcturians and said they were the ad most advanced civilization in our galaxy. Um, so Arcturians extraterrestrial believe in a higher state of being, and they've mastered many aspects of today's modern age metaphysical beliefs. So like I said, they're spiritual guides and teachers. Um, so they invested a lot of their resources to defend Earth from the reptilian and gray aliens and their agenda. So not only is there Pleiadian ships looking out after Earth, but also Arcturian ships um, that are here. And the Arcturian ships are freaking amazing, okay? I've been on board their ships. It's freaking amazing. Um, so they're also known for their power of healing. So like I said, they're teachers, guides, and healers. Um, uh, so this is mostly what defines Arcturus as an amazing race among the galaxy. Um, but they're also, I think, masters of um, the conscious mind. Um, so many of our concepts of manifestation or how to create um, you know, 5D realities come from Arcturus. Uh, so they call Arcturus the way of the mind. And, um, and so a lot of our concepts of metaphysics come from Arcturus. Uh, so these are other dimensional advanced star beings. Um, they are able to be contacted through channeling and divination. 
Uh, but and some of us might have direct contact with Arcturians. Uh, uh, I think that's happening more and more, not just with me, but with a lot of people. A lot of people are telling me they're connecting with Arcturians, you know, so, you know, they're, they're coming forward. Uh, they're helping us all out. Um, so Arcturus, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the uh, consequent slides, but Arcturus is considered to be the second major stargate on our galaxy, second to Antares. Arcturus, um, according to J.J. Hurtak, is the um, is the stargate of souls. Um, so he talks about that in his book called The Keys of Enoch. I met J.J. Hurtak. He's an amazing channeler, um, just an amazing person overall. But um, uh, so some of us, you know, well, you know, when we pass, actually, all of us, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that all of us, when we pass away from this, from a physical incarnation, we return to Arcturus. So we get processed through Arcturus um, and uh, then uh, get prepared for our next incarnation. Um, so Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom, was considered to have a home in Arcturus or was from there. Uh, so a little bit about the star system here. Let's talk about this wonderful star system. Um, I'm going to move some of this stuff here. Let's see if I can do that. Um, so, um, so this is considered to be the, the brightest alpha star in the Bodas constellation. And uh, let me see, and then I'll get into... Um, so it's a large orange star, um, and it is huge. It's, I mean, I think it, it's like, I don't know, like 10 times the size of our sun. I mean, it's huge. I mean, and it's not even the biggest star on, in the galaxy, but it's, it's huge compared to, to our sun. Um, and so it's located, like I mentioned before, about 37 light years, and it's the fourth brightest star in our night nice sky. Um, so it's pretty bright. Uh, usually you can see Arcturus really well in the summer sky, at least in the Northern hemisphere. So if you're in the Northern hemisphere, um, you can usually see it best um, in July and August. Seems like those are the two months um, and also in November. Um, so um, Arcturians are highly advanced beings. Um, they're known for advanced knowledge, wisdom and extremely high frequencies. So uh, they're at the very minimal 5D and they go all the way up to 12D. Um, so earth frequency, a lot of times is very dense for them. So they don't like coming here visiting earth until we start getting to the fifth dimension. Then I think they'll visit us more. But um, now these, like I mentioned before, they specialize in emotional and spiritual healing. Um, they are masters at integrating technologies with spiritual energies, which is what we're going to see Earth also moving towards. Um, uh, so it's the home of an energy gateway that where souls pass through between death and birth, like I mentioned in the last slide. And uh, they are also known to be the keepers of the Akashic records. So Arcturian beings process a lot of souls and, you know, through the Stargate. And so when they're processing these souls, these souls have to go through some sort of a life review. So a lot of times these Arcturian beings are pulling information from the records um, to help these souls get processed. Uh, so, um, so these Arcturian beings uh, will, I don't know, um, they, they help guide these souls um, as far as setting up um, I would say goals for their next incarnation. And then oftentimes they'll help them pick out, okay, what kind of, what kind of incar next incarnation do I want to have? Um, and so for this reason, they have a direct connection with the Akashic records. Uh, so we see a lot of, even a lot of Arcturian star seeds that work with, um, uh, that, that work with these, um, with these records. Um, and it's part of the reason why I have a connection with these records. Uh, um, they're also considered to be the creators of complex sacred geometry. So it's thought that a lot of the crop circles that we see in the British Isles and some other parts of the planet were actually created by Arcturians. Um, so they were sending us messages through these crop circles. Um, so they weren't, they weren't man-made. <laughs> I think most of us can look at a crop circle and know they're not man-made. They're, they're too complex. Um, 
a little bit about Arcturians. Um, so let's get into these beings, amazing beings. Uh, so Arcturians, um, like I mentioned before, are not descendants of Lyra Vega refugees. Um, they are a separate consciousness um, that developed after the separation of oversouls in the galaxy. So this was millions and millions of years ago, maybe billions of years ago. Um, so during the initial creation of the galaxy, um, so they were they set aside to be the overseers or spiritual guardians. Um, so this is why they are also the keepers of the, of the Akashic records. Um, and uh, they, they are the, the premier guides for other star systems. So you see Arcturian influence in many different star systems. Uh, because of their separate evolution, um, Arcturian beings tend to be the le least physical of many star races. And they look the least humanoid, um, at least as far as physically, um, their physical appearance. Uh, they also have some genetic, cultural, and personality differences from other well-known star systems. So I always say that Arcturian star seeds were kind of quirky, were a little bit different. I don't know, um, not in a bad way. I think we're, we're kind of geeky or different. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and it's because we just kind of look at things from a higher perspective maybe, but, um, but also because we were, um, uh, we're also kind of multi-talented. I think we, we had to be, to be able to help guide a lot of these other star races. Um, so the Arcturian system is the home to one of the most advanced civilizations in our galaxy. So this is a 5D to 11D vibrational civilization, a prototype. Um, the vibrational energy specific to this civilization um, acts as an emotional, mental, and spiritual healer for humanity on Earth. Um, and like I mentioned many times before, they're also the gateway of souls. Um, uh, Arcturians, uh, they work in close connection with uh, various descended masters who they call the brotherhood of the all um, or the fraternity of totality. Um, they also work directly with what they refer to as the galactic command. Um, so they're also a major player in the galactic federation. Um, and I've, I've done a lot of Akashic readings for Arcturian star people that have had um, uh, past incarnations uh, with the Galactic Federation. Um, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of it in the Orion system, which we're gonna talk about in a minute here. Um, so the Arcturians travel the, uh, the galaxy um, in their starships or in the universe actually, and uh, they, they're considered to be some of the most advanced. Uh, their contributions to Earth. Um, so, um, so one of the reasons why Earth was never attacked by malevolent aliens, like I mentioned, I think in the, a couple of slides ago, is because of the Arcturian advanced ships. Um, so these interstellar vessels um, uh, were the accumulation of perfection. So they're very, very advanced. Um, uh, so uh, I've been on board an Arcturian starship. That was how I got awakened to all of this. And I can speak from firsthand that their ships are freaking amazing. I mean, it's, it's it, they have technology I've never, ever, ever seen. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, can't, I can't even begin to describe how um, advanced their ships are. Um, so one of their starships, a lot of people have heard about the Athena, which was named after the Greek goddess of wisdom. And um, uh, so that's one of, the, one of the starships that's currently in the solar system here. Uh, they're gifted healers, um, but they are different than the healers that we see from Andromeda. Okay, we're going to talk about Andromeda next. Um, now, Arcturian race, they, were, they didn't have as much of a direct influence on planet Earth as the Syrians and the, the, Ple the Pleiadians. So they had very specialized missions on Earth. Um, so there was maybe only a few areas of planet Earth that maybe had some direct uh, Arcturian involvement. Um, so um, they have in the past um, 
help resolve very serious conflicts in our area of the universe. Um, so Arcturians uh, tend to be masters at mediation and uh, communication. So, so a lot of times they use their mediation skills to help um, different star people, including planet Earth. Um, so a lot of souls are brought to the Arcturian starships, just like I was brought up on, on their ship during the dream state. Um, so a lot of times these souls are brought to these ships to be worked on, you know, help there's, you know, adjust their frequency or help heal them. Although the Arcturians would never invade a person's free will. So they don't abduct people. Okay. So it's usually that's kind of a mutual agreement between the soul and the Arcturians. Um, so they won't just abduct people willy nilly, you know, like the gray aliens do. They'll, they have an agreement with that person to bring them on board their ships. Um, the Arcturians are here to assist Earth um, into entering the fourth and the fifth dimensions um, and raising our vibrational frequencies. Uh, um, they stand as the guardians and protectors of higher consciousness in the universe. Um, um, so they've done much to help raise the overall levels of consciousness in our universe. So we're going to move into Andromeda, and then I think Orion is, I think, the last system, and then we're going to get into ET colonization on Earth. Um, and I'm going to try to move through this a little quickly so we can get to that last part, because I think that that'll be really important. Um, so Andromedans are predominantly, um, as far as the humanoid version of the Andromedans, so Andromedans actually had quite a few different uh, species of beings in their system. And the, I'm talking predominantly about Andromeda constellation here. So, so this is different from Andromeda galaxy that I mentioned earlier. Um, so Andromeda galaxy is about 2 million light years from our galaxy, um, even though they're our closest neighbor. Um, and Andromeda constellation is 2000 light years away. So they're even further away than, than the Pleiades. Um, so they say there's about 28, um, at least 28 different races of beings and some are humanoid and some aren't. Um, now the humanoid Andromedans were descendants of Lyrans that escaped the war. So not all of them ended up in the Pleiades. Some of them also headed towards Cassiopeia and Andromeda. Um, so they have races of beings that are humanoids, plants, animals, insects, and also etheric and plasmic conscious life forms. Uh, there's also um, winged humanoid beings, um, like higher dimensional beings that some people think are angels, but might be Andromedan <laughs> beings visiting earth, you know, so, um, so I do think there's the angelic realm and maybe some of these angelic beings might be Andro higher dimensional Andromedans. Um, uh, and some of these winged beings also had their originations with the avian races, which um, originated from a different universe originally. Um, so the Andromedans are about 45,000 years ahead of us technologically. So, <laughs> so they have technology that we can't even imagine here on earth. Uh, and they're a very spiritually gifted race, uh, very spiritually advanced. Um, so they're guardians of the seventh and ninth dimensions. Uh, they're noted in the Galactic Federation for their mastery of scientific and technological endeavors. Um, the frequency in Andromeda, so I, we don't get as many Andromedan star seeds here on Earth because their frequency is so high in Andromeda. Um, so this affects the ease of incarnation and the amount of soul energy that can be maintained in the human form when these souls incarnate in 3D. So sometimes, so I get a lot of Andromedan star seeds that I work with that struggle to be here on Earth. I mean, they're just like, a lot of them have like health issues or, or they might be struggling um, uh, in various different ways, you know, energetically because they are used to being in a much higher vibrational realm. Um, a little bit of information about their star system. Uh, so let me get into their star system here. Um, 
So Andromeda constellation is actually a pretty decent sized constellation. It's the 19th largest in our galaxy. Um, so it's located in the area of, um, uh, of Aries and Pisces. So it's located just above Aries and Pisces. So here's Andromeda, here's Aries and Pisces constellations. Uh, and it's located close to Cassiopeia, close to Perseus, close to Pegasus, you know, so there's a lot of other star systems in that area that are associated with the myth of Perseus. Um, uh, Alpharaz is their biggest star, um, but Almach and Miroc are also important star systems in the Andromeda constellation. So those are the three largest stars. Um, like I mentioned before, they're home to 28 species of beings. Um, so a lot of them are um, humanoid and uh, descendants of Lyran refugees that descended, that fled to Andromeda. Um, now these are people that are meant that are just that are considered to be masters of technology, um, maybe even more so than the Arcturians, uh, but they are masters of technologies and scientific endeavors. And they also, I get a lot of Andromedan star seeds that are masters at frequency healing. So a lot of my Andromedan star seeds end up working in energy healing. So that's pretty neat. Um, they tend to be angelic in nature. They're, they're highly telepathic and highly regarded spiritual guides. So a little bit about the Andromeda culture. Um, so these people were descendants of Lyrans. We mentioned that before. And they also had star, you know, races that were indigenous to that system and very some non-physical beings that lived there. Um, so after the Lyra Draconian Wars, um, so they, there were some Lyran humans that were in starships that went way beyond the Pleiades and um, ended up so seeking refuge in the Cassiopeia system and then eventually made their way to Andromeda. Um, so while they were hiding out in, in Cassiopeia, there were indigenous races in the Cassiopeian. Um, there, there were cat, actually cat beings um, that uh, assisted them and recommended that they make their homes in Andromeda. Um, so they ended up settling in uh, two solar systems in the Andromeda constellation. So that would be Alpharaz and Merak. Um, eventually they did also colonize Almach, um, which is the third system. Um, so they were terraformed uh, or to accommodate these Lyran refugees. Uh, um, so the Andromedan people um, actually evolved physically. So um, they started looking very different than their Lyran ancestors because they had to adapt to the environmental conditions in um, their new planets, um, which were very different than those in Lyra. You know, so um, they had a lack of gravity and they also had very heavy copper content. So Alex Collier talks about this quite a bit um, in some of the channelings he's done from these, these Andromedan beings. Um, so you might wanna, if you're interested in Andromeda, you might wanna follow some of his work. Um, I think he's pretty freaking amazing. So, and a lot of what he talks about correlates with what I saw on the records. Um, uh, so their body types ended up becoming much more elongated and their skin turned from white to blue. Um, so here's a depiction of some Andromedan females. Um, they're kind of like very elongated looking. Uh, they were considered to be very beautiful. Um, so uh, because they were so remotely located, um, Andromedan civilization developed very rapidly um, because they had no interferences you know, from other systems. So they were just, in their own lane doing their own thing. Um, so they became very advanced uh, technologically and spiritually. Um, so they're considered to be some of the most advanced and evolved races in our galaxy, um, along with the Arcturians. Okay, we're gonna get into the Andromedan um, in, in contributions to earth. Um, oops, um, nope, I wanna go back. Oh, now I gotta go through all these. Um, sorry, guys, I have to go through all these guys again. Uh, we'll get to the next slide. Sorry about that. 
Um, okay, one more, and then we'll get to the next slide. Okay. So their contributions to Earth. Um, so millions of years ago, the Andromedans visited Earth. Um, and uh, this was when the Syrians were starting to establish themselves in colonies. Um, so the Syrians actually welcomed the Andromedans. Um, and they set up also um, outposts throughout um, Earth and also in inner Earth. Um, now, my understanding from the Akashic records is that um, Many of the Andromedans settled in um, not only Lemuria, but also um, the, the British Isles. So we see a lot of Andromedan influence as, long, as well as in Pleiadian influence in the British Isles and also mainly in Southeast Asia. So we see a lot of Andromedan influence in the Pacific Rim and Southeast Asia. So a lot of their culture was actually directly influenced from the Andromedan culture. Um, and you can see that in the way they dress and, you know, their, their, their customs and their medicine, a lot of that came, were influenced from Andromedans. Um, so initially these outposts were for just research purposes only. They weren't really in, as interested in hybridizing the earth human species. So like the Arcturians, they didn't have as much of a direct connection with the genetic manipulation here on earth. Um, but they were mainly interested in studying the flora and the fauna of Earth. Um, so I, a lot of Arcturian star seeds tend to work more with the environment for that reason. So um, the ones that don't do energy healing sometimes will do like earth grid healing or, or they work with animals or things like that. Um, so some of the Andromedan genetic experiments with plants were used to aid the Assyrians in creating a more durable Syrian body and to aid in their genetic manipulation of the Earth Human Genome Project. So they had an influence, a little bit of an influence on that, but more of an indirect way. Um, Andromedan humanoid races um, really revered the universal law of free will and freedom. Um, so they didn't want to interfere that much with the human, um, earth human evolution. So they have a mostly a hands-off approach. Um, so that's why you don't see as many Andromedan star seeds here as maybe other star seeds. Um, um, so from their present time human perspective, um, or, or from the present human time perspective, um, we, we have a small contribution from the Andromeda, Andromedan culture towards our mental abilities, but not so much in our physical bodies. Um, so unlike Syrian and Pleiadian genetics, Andromedan genetics just aren't as prevalent on in Earth humans. So the etheric winged beings from Andromeda, um, I mentioned this before, but they've been somewhat involved with Earth uh, during the first life formed um, during various stages of our development. So it may be that maybe some of the angelic beings that were talked about in the Middle East mm -hmm. or the Sumerian winged beings might have been, that were depicted on the reliefs, might have been representations mm -hmm. of Andromedan beings and not Anunnaki as previously thought. Uh, so we're gonna get into Orion. I'm gonna get through this Orion section and then we're gonna talk about um, some of the earth civilizations. So um, in this section, I'm gonna mainly talk about the constellation of Orion and even the nebula. Um, so we're gonna talk about the light and the light, dark aspects of the people of Orion. And Orion also had a very direct influence on earth. There was a lot of Orion um, factions that ended up migrating to Earth after Orion uh, became unified. Um, so we're going to talk about that later. But um, um, so there's some, you know, galactic history that's also associated with the system that influenced Earth. Um, so some of the negative um, extraterrestrial entities we hear so much about um, uh, here on Earth uh, are associated with some of the stars in the Orion constellation. Um, but there's also some sources that claim that the Orion Nebula is a cosmic uh, doorway to infinity or the realm of the creator. So it's considered that the Orion Light Councils were actually in the Orion Nebula and not in the Orion uh, constellation. Um, 
So um, Orion was kind of like the melting pot of um, our galaxy. So Orion is such a huge constellation. It has so many stars that there's lots of different types of beings that live in the Orion system. So for that reason, I kind of jokingly, or kind of half seriously, half jokingly compare it to Star Wars. And I actually think Star Wars is the story of the Orion Wars, you know, so, um, cause they had an empire, they had like the Draconian empire that was trying to take over everything. And then they had the belt star people that were trying to resist the empire, just like the star Wars saga. Um, I'm a big star Wars fan. So I, I, and I don't know if you guys have just, uh, uh any of you follow the Mandalorian, but I guess, um, uh, they're going to try to save Mandalore. <laughs> so we'll see what happens in the next, um, next season. But, um, but these might be based on actual civilizations that may have been influenced or, or maybe there was some, some correlation between what we see in Star Wars and what we see um, with the Orion history. Um, uh, so um, uh, until the recent integration of the Orion system to the Orion light consciousness, um, the, the, init, the energy in Orion has always been in, um, connected with polarity conflict. So um, Earth is actually undergoing a similar evolution where we're moving past polarity consciousness to unity consciousness. So in that sense, uh, um, we feel a connection to Orion, and there's a lot of influence uh, from Orion for that reason. Um, so I'm going through a very similar evolution. Just a little bit about the star system. So the Orion system is probably the best known and easily recognizable in the night sky. It's also known as the hunter. And everybody usually can pick out the three belt stars, which is Analam, Analtak, and Mintaka. Um, personally, I love Mintaka. It's a, an amazing star system, probably the highest vibrational there, but, uh, but all three systems are part of the belt star configuration. Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, and Rigel were also very well-known stars in this system. Um, it contains the Great or Orion Nebula, where thousands of stars are thought to be born and the home of the Orion Light Councils. Uh, let me bring up that bullet. Um, so Orion, like Sirius, um, is the home of many galactic races. So a lot of diversity, a lot of diversity of beings in Orion. Um, so uh, some are humanoid, so some were descendants of Vega people and, and some Laren people, but there was also a lot of non-humanoids. So there was a lot of reptilians, gray aliens, because actually Orion is located close to Zeta Reticuli as well. So a lot of influence from, you know, tall grays and small grays in, in the Orion system. And there was also a lot of, of, of insectoid beings. So, um, so for that reason, uh, when I, when I saw the, um, and when I watched Star Wars movies and I, 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 it was the original Star Wars. I think it was like, uh, what was it called? Uh, the New Hope. Um, this was like the one, the original one that came out in 1977 or 1976. Um, uh, the, the cantina scene um, in that movie reminds me a lot of Orion. It just, it was like that. A lot of mix, mixture of beings. Um, so like I mentioned before, the inherent energy in Orion is polarity conflict. Um, it does have a very long history of wars and rebellion. Um, so a little bit about the Orion um, history here. So um, like I mentioned before, it is the melting pot of the galaxy. Um, it's kind of similar to the United States here. I mean, it's kind of like just a melting pot of all kinds of different beings. Um, and uh, I already mentioned Star Wars, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, but most of the beings in the Orion system are descended from the blue skin Vega people, but there was also some, um, also uh, the reptilians, the Orion reptilians came from, were mostly located in Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, or Rigel, um, sorry. And uh, were descended from draconian beings from Draco. 
Um, small grays um, occupy a small percentage of the Orion population because um, Zeta reticuli was close to Orion. Um, so tall grays were also there. And uh, also they had amphibian and insectoid beings there. Uh, so there's quite, quite, quite a lot of diversity in Orion. So there's, that's part of the reason why they had so much conflict there. Um, so Orion people or Orion beings have a, a reputation for an aggressive nature um, and have been involved in many destructive wars that have kind of been lasted for millennia. So millions of years in the Orion system. Um, so uh, this pattern of behavior still operates in our galaxy is not as prevalent. Um, because most of the star races now are evolved. Um, we're trying to resolve that here on Earth. So, um, so that's where we can learn from Orion. Um, so there is a symbiotic relationship between consciousness and technology uh, with the Orion races. Um, they push this principle to the limit and developed advanced technology while still waging con constant wars and conflicts. Um, so a lot of times the the, um, you know, the light against the dark was a big theme there um, with the peace loving Orion people that were um, constantly trying to maintain their self sovereignty from the uh, more aggressive Orion people that were in the outlier stars. So, so as a rule, most of the belt star people were um, in Orion were the self sovereign rebellious uh, freedom fighter people and the outlier stars are part of the empire. Um, contributions to earth. So, uh, so some of the aggressive authoritative na nature of earth came from the Orion system. Um, so a lot of our patriarchal systems here on earth um, was, was mostly influenced by um, Orion civilization. Um, and uh, whereas inhabitants from the Sirius system, which were also very much involved with Earth, uh, carry more of the feminine energies, you know, so, so we had that balance between, you know, father god consciousness and the mother goddess consciousness. Uh, so a lot of the dark forces that um, escaped from Orion and Maldek um, actually in, reincarnated on Mars and Earth. And a lot of them are still here on Earth at this time, since the times of Atlantis. Um, so that's why we see a lot of aggression and authoritative nature that's been, um, you know, pervades in this planet even now, um, including thousands of years of reinforced reliance on patriarchal systems. Now that is changing. We're going to be moving more towards maybe more of a balance, hopefully. Um, and we're moving more towards integrating more feminine consciousness as we speak. Um, now on the positive side, um, now there was some positive <laughs> aspects of Orion. They weren't all bad. Um, uh, so they have contributed their propensity for the development of smoothly running systems. Um, so like the Syrians, these were people that knew how to navigate physical reality. Um, so they're the source of many organizational structures of government, business, and industry. So that came, all came from Orion. Um, now this energy is relevant to Earth people's frequency as it stands currently, but we will soon outgrow it. So we'll, we'll become more evolved um, as in, in this current timeline. And we're gonna be um, bringing in more um, advanced templates from more, some of the more advanced races such as the Lyrans and the Pleiadians. Okay, so ET colonization on Earth. Um, so many extraterrestrial groups have colonies in very specific areas of Earth during ancient times, um, which have had genetic and cultural influence from these ET groups to the, these locations to this day. So I was mentioning some of this in some of the previous slides, but this is a rundown of um, uh, specific areas of Earth and their uh, galactic or ET influences. So. In the UK, we see Pleiades, Lyra, Andromeda, and Syria. So a lot of things were happening in the UK. It was a major vantage point because of the ley lines. So a lot of ET influence in that area. Um, Northern Europe and Scandinavia, we see Aldebaran and Pleiades influences there. 
Um, China and Southeast Asia, Draco, Orion, and Andromedan influences in that part of the world. Um, Africa is Anunnaki, Sirius, and Orion. Um, Italy is Arcturus and Pleiades. Uh, Greece is Antares. Middle East is Anunnaki, Sirius, and Orion, just like Africa. Um, Russian and Slavic and Balkans is Tau Ceti, which we didn't talk about, um, but they're a small star system in the Cetus constellation located fairly close to Earth. Um, and Lyra and Pleiades. Um, in Australia, we see influences from Arcturus and Andromeda because they were located so close to, uh, to Lemuria and uh, New Zealand also, because um, Lemuria was founded by mostly Andromedans and Arcturian colonists that were trying to start a more advanced spiritual civilization on planet Earth. Um, uh, New Zealand too is very influenced from Andromeda. Um, Hawaii and Polynesia, Arcturus, also Arcturus and Andromeda. So a lot of the Pacific Rim. Um, South America indigenous is Pleiades, Procyon, and Sirius. We didn't talk about Procyon, but it's a small star system located in Canis Minor, which is very close to Sirius. Um, North America indigenous is Pleiades, Sirius, and Arcturus. And India, West Asia is Vega and Sirius. Um, so I see many trends and correlations with these ET races influence and my clients' earth lineages when I'm conducting galactic Akashic readings. Um, so I get some folks that choose to incarnate, that may be like say a Vega star seed and they decide to incarnate into an Indian family because they contain Vega genetics, um, for instance. Uh, so it's generally believed that our extraterrestrial creators intervened at least two times in the evolution of our species. So the first time would have happened probably approximately 400,000 years ago. So this was um, initially the creation of the Neanderthal. And then a second intervention that happened approximately 2,000 years ago led to the creation of Homo sapiens. Um, and uh, this, yeah, at the same time, our DNA strands, like I was mentioning earlier, actually went from 12 strands to two strands uh, because this was done to prevent us from overtaking our alien creators on the evolutionary scale. So there were some beings like the Anunnaki from Sirius C that wanted to keep humans contained, I guess, you know, earth humans. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or, or, or in some extreme places enslaved. Um, but that has that, that also changed. Um, so we're now get, becoming upgraded again. Uh, it seems, however, like I mentioned before, that they're uh, underestimated our DNA's inherent drive for evolution. And uh, because we are currently now all awakening and uh, we're rapidly catching up to them, okay? Um, especially in this last decade. We're seeing major advances and not just in technology, but also in um, our spiritual evolution. A lot of us are awakening right now. So, um, so they can try to hold us down, but they won't be able to. Um, so that brings us to our last slide. Um, so, um, so under, this is just a little comment I wanted to make as a closing statement. Um, so understanding the parameters of galactic history in terms of the various extraterrestrial races, conflicts and migrations is essential for all earth humans who desire to fully comprehend not just our past, but also our ascension and evolution to our future as true galactic citizens of this galaxy. This is why this is all so important. Um, so, uh, so that we not only understand past mistakes or past trends as we see in uh, future evolution, but also our future um, as presented by the, our more, more advanced uh, star, star people. Um, so let me see if I can bring up the last slide. Um, there we go. Okay, so. I wanna thank you all for attending this presentation. I know it was quite long and I appreciate you hanging in. There's a lot to talk about. So thank you so much. And 
Um, if you want to check out my work, I'm at debbiesolaris.com. Um, we just revamped our um, galactic history section. Um, we put in a lot of new artwork um, that was created by um, my dear friend and videographer who um, created a lot of AI art that depicted, um, had beautiful depictions of alien beings. So um, please visit that if you want to see more of the depiction of these beings. And that's pretty much it. So thank you. I'm going to go ahead and un I'm going to try to unshare here so we can get back to, um, to the regular screen. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Wow, that was absolutely amazing. And we had people, you know, texting back and forth. And I know we have a lot of questions. Are you up to answer a few questions? Yeah, before? sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah. So maybe a few minutes. Um, you know, we'll see what what comes through. And um, all right. Yeah. So we already have a hand up. Do you want to come off? Uh, uh, you want to go ahead and put your photo up so we can bring you up to ask your question. Hi, thank you. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Hello, everybody. Hi, Hi there. Uh, thank you for such a comprehensive and rich, rich, rich presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I have a question for you, and that is, we um, we are learning more and more about our multi-dimensional self. How each one of us live in different dimensions. We have ourselves. Uh, as as entity as beings ourselves and Mother Earth is the same way different dimensions, and one of the things that I've been studying about through ancient doctrine was that the Akashic record that we each have access to is uh, is depends on the kind of the sphere that we are looking at, meaning from the Earth sphere or is it a galactic sphere or universal sphere, mm -hmm. and so I guess I wanted to ask you. How does your, um, it feels, it felt like a linear story of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in with the multidimensional reality that we're now learning more about? And thank you so much in advance. Oh, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that question because it's one that I think about a lot, actually, um, when I do the Akashic work. Um, I presented the story more in a linear fashion because that's how we as earth people um, relate to time. So, but in actual reality or, you know, in the higher realms, there is no linear time. So a lot of these stories might be simultaneously ongoing even today, you know, in higher dimensions. So there's overlays of, of aspects of, that's why there was, you know, Laren people that were visiting earth, even though typically, Lyra was a civilization that existed millions of years ago. So how would they be able to visit Earth if Earth wasn't even a thing, you know, but, but because in the higher realms, there's a multidimensional aspect, you know, these beings were able not only to travel long distances, but also to transcend the space-time continuum um, and to travel forward and backwards in time. Um, so, um, so a lot of times when I'm telling the story, I try to do it mostly in a linear faction, fact, 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 or fact, or a linear way, just so we have, I don't know, it just kind of makes sense to me. I guess that's just my, my analytical way of looking at things, but, but it's actually simultaneously happening all at once. I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, yeah, uh, but as far as the Akashic records, um, for a long time, I think because our consciousness wasn't quite at, at a certain level yet, um, many Akashic readers in the past were only able to access earth re records. And now that in the last, I would say, um, decade or so, or maybe even before then, you know, we're now able to access the galactic um, Akashic records because our consciousness has expanded that much. But, um, um, so, and, and we all contribute to the Akashic records. So, you know, it's not like only a selected few get to access the records. Um, all of us get to access the record. We're all contributing to the records as higher dimensional beings. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Oops, any other questions? Uh, yes, we do have a couple questions and thank you so much for that one. Uh, Dawn, you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you. I missed most of the beginning. I had another event, but I'm so glad you actually continued on long because I saw the end. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, the, thank you. Um, I, um, I wanted to know more. You mentioned that you didn't talk about Procyon, and I'm, I've really seen very little about that. Can you say a little bit more about Procyon? Oh yeah, absolutely. A ton of my, um, I'm trying to change the light. The light seems a little bright. <laughs> so I was like looking at myself and I'm like, bright, bright light. Um, so maybe if I push it back, it won't be quite so bright. So uh, to, to answer your question about Procyon, Procyon was kind of a sister star system to Sirius. Uh, so Sirius is located in Canis Major and his closest neighbor was Procyon, which is in Canis Minor. Uh, which is the little dog. So we've got big dog, little dog. So these are two um, constellations that were located fairly close to Orion. Uh, so Procyon was actually a system that was uh, heavily influenced by Lyran refugees that left um, Lyra that maybe didn't necessarily settle in Sirius, but they settled in, um, in Procyon. And because there was a lot of, I think they were just trying to survive for quite a long time, they became heavily, um, heavily technological. So these were people that were, they were space warriors, they were space explorers, they were, um, they had beautiful starships, you know, they were, you know, traveling, traversing the galaxy. Um, but they were mainly focused on technology for quite a while until they started having more interactions with their Syrian neighbors. Um, so the Syrians and the Procyon people actually kind of tag team a lot on a, on a lot of different galactic projects. Uh, so uh, the, the Procyonian people were actually able to share a lot of their tech, advanced technologies with the Syrians who were desiring to, you know, to ramp up their their technology. And then the Syrians were assisting the um, Procyon people with spirituality and healing. Um, so I actually have a number of Procyon star seeds that actually work in the health and wellness field here on earth for that reason. Um, uh, like one of my, my clients was, uh, was a dietitian and he was from Procyon and, uh, but he was also a bodybuilder and, you know, he, um, you know, so the Procyonian people, because they were influ you know, they were descendants of Lyrans, they were very physical people. Um, and so a lot of them were, um, they looked humanoid, but they had, I don't know, um, more muscular body form or, you know, very well built people um, uh, because they were space, uh, you know, space warriors, you know, so they, they learned to fight quite well. Um, so maybe the Mandalorians were maybe based off of the Procyonians, I don't know, but, um, uh, but yeah, they had a beautiful civilization. Um, I, I have a lot of admiration for the Procyonians. Uh, this was something I heard by Tolek, who, um, I don't know if you guys know who Tolek is, but he talk, he's very connected with the Andromeda Council, and he's actual a human person. He, he channels the Andromedans, much like um, Alex Collier does, but he once talked about how the, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but um, he talked about how the Procyonians and the Syrians um, tag team together to take out some of the underground reptilian bases on planet earth. And there was 13 bases and the Procyonians were able to take out 10 of those um, 10 of those uh, bases and the, I think the Syrians did two of them, but um, I don't know why the Procyonians did more, but, but maybe because they were space warriors, but, um, but if that's the case, we need, probably need to give them a medal or something for helping us out, you know, um, but, but they're an amazing race of people and they, they did actually have an influence on planet earth. Um, they tried to contact, I think our, our government a couple of times, but our government was more interested in weaponized technology. So um, the Procyonians didn't want anything to do with that. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that's my, the main thing I see, I, I can talk about the Procyonians. There's a lot I wish I knew more about them. Um, 
I, it's, it's kind of, there, I get a few star seeds that are from Procyon in my galactic readings, but galactic Akashic readings, but not very many. Um, so they're kind of a, a minor um, race as a, you know, it, compared to Sirius, mm -hmm. as far as, you know, star seeds, you know, coming here to earth. Thank you. But still, that's more information than I knew, definitely. So thank you. Thank you. No, I wish I, I knew more. Um, I'd like to know more about their history, but um, but there's still things I'm learning from the records, too. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn, for that question. Now, Heidi has a question that said, could you elaborate on who the co-creators are, where they're from, and are they the Elohim? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, my understanding um, is that, um, and, and I'm going to have to go back to the Andromeda Galaxy days again, but uh, and even beyond that, um, is that um, when Source decided to split itself off into multiple versions of itself, um, uh, it, it, it decided to have this dis descent into physicality in multiple universes. Um, so there's founder races that go from one universe to another to start this experiment in each universe. Um, so it was our universe's turn to have this experience. And initially this, this uh, descent into physicality was supposed to happen in the Andromeda galaxy, but Andromeda galaxy was just too high vibrational, couldn't sustain physicality. So the Andromeda galaxy soul group who were etheric light beings and who were you know, uh, co-creators of stars and nebulas and planets created the Milky Way to be a simulation uh, galaxy for this backdrop of physicality. So um, these founder races, some of them were avian beings that came from diff different universes. Some of them were, uh, were feline beings. Uh, so we see a lot of, lot of inf feline influences in even our genetics uh, and avian genetics. Uh, I mean, and, uh, avian also influences on our genetics. Uh, and yes, they do comprise of the Elohim. So, so these race, these beings were coming through the Antari Stargate from Andromeda Galaxy into our galaxy. And they created kind of a coalition of um, galactic councils in that uh, a, a, Aquila constellation, which is uh, Altair is the main star there. Um, and these were comprised of the Elohim. Um, who carry, I think, uh, different color rays of energy. So um, I'm not an Elohim. Uh, I wish I, I, I wish I knew a little bit more about the Elohim, except that I do know that they are the archetypes of higher dimensional beings that pretty much co-created the physical life that was in the Lyra constellation. Um, but they might have comprised of some of them were maybe these uh, feline beings. So the, the felines actually uh, initially were an etheric race that um, when they were creating the Lyra system created multiple versions of themselves. You know, so they so in the Bible they talk about how I think God or or you know they say that. Um, we created man in our own image. Well, if it's just one God, why do they say our image? Um, I always wondered about that because I was a Bible scholar, you know, back in the day, you know, so I was always wondering why they, why would God, if it's one entity, would say our image? And I think it's because it was the Elohim who were one step below source, who were creating humanity and, you know, these sentient races in their own image. So the Adamic karmic, template, which is, you know, the human form with the two arms, two legs and head, um, is a template that's been carried over from multiple uh, universes. So this is a template that's worked very well. So they were creating us in that image. Um, but yeah, that was a great question. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Beautiful. And before I go to the last uh, question, Bridget, do we have any questions from our Awake and Ascending family on Clubhouse? Hello, hello. Let me, <laughs> let me check um, who has what. Okay, so Momo, our lovely Momo Moon, says, please tell her this was amazingly informative. We have comments, but no questions so far. Everyone is just really loving it. And definitely so the room much. chat is like that. that. I appreciate the positive feedback. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, Debbie. It is lovely to get to listen to you here at the Galactic Alliance. And no, thank you for having me. Work. This has been awesome. <laughs> it's been an awesome uh, venue, awesome format. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Bridget. Um, I have a private message from someone that says, can can you speak more about why Arcturus is considered the gateway for the soul? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, uh, I picked up a little bit about Arcturus history um, and it was considered to be, uh, so when, when the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy was created, uh, there's always this mother goddess consciousness and this father god consciousness template that's been followed, you know, throughout, you know, our evolution. Um, so, you know, source initially split itself off into those two factions and everything is based off of that initial con uh, uh, template. So uh, Antares in our galaxy was considered to be the Omega mother goddess consciousness Stargate. So they had to have a, I'm sorry, it was the alpha, um, yeah, the, the Omega Father God. Um, the Alpha Mother Goddess Consciousness was, um, no, that was the, the Alpha Mother Goddess Consciousness is the, um, sorry, I'm getting confused here, sorry, it's, it's really late. Um, uh, so, uh, so let me just, let me just say that the Father God Consciousness Stargate is Arcturus. Um, so there's always this template, you know, so, um, uh, so Antares is a portal. So it's, it's the birthing place of the, of the galaxy, but, um, so, you know, it is aligned with the mother goddess consciousness, but the, um, the storehouse of information in our galaxy is Arcturus. Um, so Arcturus was created to be the gateway of souls because these were the beings that were the guardians of the galaxy. So they were set aside to be the, the, you know, the higher level kind of the overseers of this great experiment. So they were, they were the more responsible ones that were able to appropriately process these souls and, um, and protect the souls at the same time. Uh, um, there was a point in Arcturian history, and I saw this in the records, and, and I'm surprised that no one else really speaks about it, but I did see in the records where um, the Draconians also tried to attack the Stargate of Arcturus. They wanted to take it over because they wanted to have control of the souls. Uh, but unlike Lyra, the Arcturians were, were prepared. You know, so they, they had advanced technology, so they were prepared and they were able to fight off the Draconians and secure their Stargate. Uh, um, but the reason why they are the Stargate of Souls is because somebody had to be the protectors of these souls that were going through this evolution of physical experiences and help guide them through their own individual and also collective um, evolution. So um, great question. Really good questions. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, this is awesome. Wow. Um, thank you yeah. so much. It's been absolutely phenomenal. I've loved listening to you. You know, a lot of times um, when I do readings, I think it's been at least twice, if not three times, um, this gateway has come up. Mm -hmm. And there was the connection to Arcturus, but in... Um, it was almost like that they were helping to enshroud the souls so that they almost like the veil that they exactly, were. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, enshrouding the souls with that veil of forgetfulness mm -hmm. so that 
as they entered, they would not re remember their magnificence and they would be able to then have, you know, the human experience. Have you ever come across that? Oh, totally. All the time. All the time. I see that a lot. Good. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're totally right on. No, I see that all the time. Uh, yeah, they, they definitely, um, it was very purposeful because a lot of people, you know, when I do Akashic readings, they'll ask me, well, how come I don't remember my past lives? You know, I, you know, and I said it was because it was purposeful. If you would have remembered your past life, you would have remembered how great you were. And then you wouldn't have all these, you know, messy human experiences that we have that we came here to experience. I mean, we wanted to be here. We wanted to have these human experiences and, and we learn from them, you know, because we can't move forward in our evolution unless we have, you know, these, these, uh, what I call kind of messy 3D, you know, experiences that help us to move to that higher evolutionary level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I tell you, it's been an absolute honor and privilege to have you here with us. Thank tonight. you for having me. I, I love having a, a fellow Coloradan here on, yeah. um, you know, our show tonight. Love to have you back at another time. Oh, and yeah. Anytime. Just let this one reach more out to time. Us. Could you please share with everyone how they can get a hold of you? Absolutely. Um, you can get a hold of me through probably pre predominantly through my website, which is debbiesolaris.com, D E B B I E S O L A R I R S. Um, I am currently offering a galactic Akashic reading course. I think we only have a couple of days left for the registration. So if you're interested in a very expansive um, Akashic reading course that's based on galactic history, um, uh, you might want to check that out. Um, I also offer uh, periodic webinars and trainings, and I do I still do personal readings, but my waiting list is quite long. So, uh, so you you can try. We'll you know we'll 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 put you on the list, but it might be a while before you get a re personal reading. But um, but thank you so. And you, I'm also on YouTube. Um, I'm on Facebook, and so just look for Debbie Solaris. You'll find me on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Beautiful. Well, thank you again so much for being here. Thank you. thank you to everyone who's joined us again tonight, who shows up week after week. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. We love you. So whether you're watching us live or on replay, whether you're on our Can apps, Roku, Amazon, Apple TV, uh, any of those different platforms, thank you so much for watching. We appreciate it. And we hope to see you back again next week. So until until then, much love, everyone, and namaste. Thank you. Have a beautiful Bye -bye. week. Good night.